All right, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Last week, we were in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And that one, you know, we talked anywhere from the fact of about seducing spirits and those in the last days, the great falling away, that uh, people will give heed to those spirits and uh, those things as well, that they'll talk about the fact of forbidding people to marry. There's a lot of people nowadays that don't want to get married because they say that if they get married, they lose all kind of benefits um, as well as far as health benefits and those things. Um, but also those that um, don't believe in getting married. Why? Because people have said, you know what, what's the point? And so uh, we talked about that for a little while. Talked about the fact of, re- you know, refusing profane and old wives' fables, the old wives' fables as well, those old wives' tales that uh, we oftentimes hear in that we should exercise unto godliness, that exercise itself does profit little, Right? You know, exercising is, is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. The Bible doesn't speak against exercise. It speaks against being lazy, but it does not speak against ed- exercise. But it says it, that exercise profits little. Why? Because godliness is what profits, a, you know, a whole lot more uh, than those things. And then, uh, then we looked at the fact of Paul talking about Timothy um, and, and telling him to let no one to, to despise his youth because of the fact that he is young, but to set an example for those that are older than he is, that way they can gain his respect, you know, as well. There's a lot of times in churches where people will look down upon young people because they're young, and they say, well, they're young and stupid, they don't know any better, but the Bible says that that's not an excuse for a person to be young and stupid. The Bible says that, you know what, set an example. If you're a young person, set an example so those people, uh, the older people will, you know, respect you um, as well. And so, like I said, we have, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting at verse 1. It says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the, uh, younger, uh, the younger as sisters with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow has children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and not, re- uh, not requite uh, their parents. For, this, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate, uh, trusts, uh, trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things, uh, give, uh, these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have, uh, have lodged strangers, if she had washed the, the saints' feet, if she have uh, relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for, they, uh, for when they had begun uh, to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having a damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give non-occasion to the adversary for, to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, uh, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may, ha- uh, it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the widows that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the, the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, uh, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth uh, out the corn, and the laborer is, worth, is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that Thou shalt observe that thou sh- that thou observe these things, without preferring one before another, doing nothing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker of other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. 
drink uh, no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach and thine often affirmities. Verse 24, some, uh, men, uh, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some uh, men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that the, the seed of your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts, Lord, that the uh, that maybe the, that the difficult passages in this uh, chapter, Lord, may they be explained clearly and well. May we understand your word. And Lord, may we change ourselves and not, uh, and not uh, sit there and try to change your word. God, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this night in Jesus' name. Amen. So this, this evening, I would say this morning, this evening, as we've gone through First Timothy chapter 5, we're going to see a wide variety of different things. We're going to see you know, the, the rule to be observed in reproofing, you know, uh, people or rebuking people, uh, the, the treatment of widows, and then we're going to go on to um, uh, the other areas of the treatment of elders, and then also uh, the issue, you know, with wine, dealing with wine, and then also uh, on different sins as well. So there's a wide variety that we're going to hit tonight, and hopefully in the next, um, in the ne- within the next 50 minutes, I will be able to do so. I say that, you know what, I have, I, you know, I tell you about how many pages of notes I have, which is usually my minimum, and I say, well, then I won't, you know, preach as long, but sometimes I find that even, you know, the shorter ones, I actually end up preaching longer than I do when I have more notes. So maybe I should do more notes next time, and I'll be shorter. I don't know if that works or not, but we'll find out. All right. So verses 1 and 2, where it says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger man as brethren, the elder woman as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. When we look at this, this is number one, is the, uh, uh, the rule to be observed in rebuking or scolding or reproofing. This is, this is uh, how we're supposed to do it. It says, we are not to rebuke or scold an older man or a woman. This is not to say that we are not to, um, if, they are, are, if they are saying stuff that is wrong, you know, that we should just leave them alone and let them just keep on going on and on. No, what it is saying is, is that we should not, you know, scold them like they're a little child. But the thing is, is that what we should do is the fact that we should, you know, re, well, we, we rebuke them or we scold them, but in a, in a, uh, um, and in like an adult, you know, kind of, you know, fashion or, or manner, the thing is, is that we don't sit there and uh, we don't go to them and, and, and put them down or belittle them. That's what he is, he is speaking of. The thing is, is that we are to respectfully and ask earnestly to urge them with correction if in error. I mean, oftentimes, um, if I, you know, meet somebody that's in error that's older than I will, I will try to do this, you know, to my, the, the best of my ability. I will sit there and try to be respectful. Why? Because for one thing, I was taught that. If somebody is older than me, or even the same age as me, or you know, sometimes when even when they're younger than me, I refer to them as sir and ma'am. That's how I was brought up, is that you, you, you respect those you know, that have gone before you. You respect those you know, around you. But the thing is, is that I would go up to them with all, you know, all things, and we could sit there sometimes to agree, to disagree. I mean, if the Bible says, hey, you know, that you're supposed to do this, I'm going to go side on the side of the Bible. I'm going to go with the Bible, um, and I can say, well, you know what? You know, this is what the Bible says, and this is what we should do. And if a person still doesn't want to listen to it, then, then you know, we'll actually get into what the Bible says when the person doesn't want to receive that correction. And remember, he is talking to Timothy that is a younger man. He's a younger uh, pastor, and so a lot of times, you know, people feel like, well, because i got a couple gray hair, I can tell this little, you know, young whippersnapper what to do. And the thing is, is that if God has called a person, and that person falls in line, and they're qualified to be a pastor— they are to respect that pastor, and they are not to belittle them just because of their age. You know, because if God has called call them and they are qualified for it, God's going to equip them, you know, uh, to preach God's word. Now, are they going to be perfect? No. I'm not perfect. You know, I, I sit there and I, you know, I try to, you know, go through God's word and make sure that what I'm preaching is what God's word says. I don't want to sit there and just isolate a verse. I want to sit there and see what all of scripture says about it before I preach it. And so, but it says, as, as we would a father or a mother. And some, you know, uh, some of us would sit there and say, well, I don't respect my father or my mother because they were never there for me. Well, the thing is, is that there is somebody in your life, 
whether it be a grandparent, you know, uncle, you know, aunt, whoever, that you respect. And so that's what he is saying. He's saying, you know what, that we are to treat that person, if they are older, with that kind of respect. And the thing is, is that, yeah, uh, you know, maybe your, your parents, you know, your mom or dad haven't been there for you, but you should still respect them in a way um, without being, you know, you know, rude or, you know, just um, kind of being a jerk to them. But you can go on, and you know what? Just because your parents, you know, I'll just tell you this, as a parent, just because your parents say something, if it goes against God's word, you don't have to follow it. That does not go for, like, taking out the trash. Like, God's word says nothing about taking out the trash, does whatever. You know what? Take out the trash because, you know, God's word says, you know what? You are to honor your parents in those things, and you are to work, right, as unto the Lord. So we look at them and it says, do not treat them harshly, harshly, and that we are to treat the younger or same age or close. Like I said, I'll call, you know, I call different, you know, people, you know, around me. Um, Lily, Lily has a friend that's 10 years old, and I'll come up to him and say, sir. And he'll come back and say, sir. And so we just kind of, you know, that's just how we are. And I just think it's really important that even at, you know, 9, 10 years old, even before then, to teach them to say, sir and ma'am. Now, I could tell you, you know, I'll do, I will tell you the story. There was a time where apparently this one person did not want to be called ma'am. I was a, a server at a, a Steak and Shake, and I came up and I said, you know, what can I get for you today, ma'am? It was a lady. You know, I, it's sad I got to preface that, but I, yes, it was a lady. And I said, you know, what can I get for you today, ma'am? And she's like, I am not a ma'am. That is my mother. And she just, you know, kind of went on for a little bit longer on that. And I just said, okay, what can I get for you? Just stayed away from the whole thing, you know, because some people, no matter what you say, they're, you know, they're, they want to be, you know, disrespectful or have that attitude about them in the first place. They can't just take it for what it's worth. And I explained to her, I just said, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry if I offended you, but that's how I was born and raised was that, you know, you know uh, when I talk to somebody else, I refer to them as ma'am or sir. That's just how I am. And so I try to be respectful in that situation, not because I was going for a tip, but because of the fact that that's how I was raised, and that's how the Bible, I think, believes, you know, I believe that the Bible teaches us to talk uh, to other people. And so we see what is this going to do. It's going to show humility. It's going to show that we're humble before them, that we, that we, that we respect them. And it's, it's to keep the relationships in the church with all purity. It's that you make sure that when we are talking to other ones that, you know, nobody is getting, you know, bitter or has any harsh feelings towards someone because of the fact of the way that we treated somebody. But if we go up to somebody with, you know, with respect and humility and we, you know, we start talking to them and, and there's something, you know, not right, you know, they need to be rebuked, at least do it in a respectful way. And so that way later on, they're not bitter or angry towards you because you did it. Because what we want them to do is, is fall in line with what God's word says and not give any reason for, uh, for that person to say, well, the devil's using them, or the devil told them to say that. The Bible doesn't say that. I've heard people use that excuse all the time. And so the big portion tonight of what we're going to be at is the treatment of widows. The treatment of widows. This is from verses uh, 3 through 16. All right, I'm not going to read it again. I just read it to you. But what it says, it says to honor them, show them respect, and show them dignity. All right? Show them dignity. Um, the Bible does speak of, of age concerning the treatment of widows and how they should live, in which um, we're going to look at here in a moment, um, because it does give a specific age, actually, to where the church is supposed to, uh, you know, is supposed to take care of them and where they're not supposed to take care of them. Okay, because there's some that will come out and say, well, I'm a widow. I don't have a, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? And also the Bible tells you what you're supposed to do. And that's the great thing is that if the Bible tells you not to do something, it's, it's also going to tell you what to do. It's not going to just leave you hanging. All right. And so this is speaking, like I said, a widow is speaking of a woman who has lost her husband. This is not a, a widower. This is a, a widow, a woman who has lost her husband. And so he goes on there and says, if a widow have children or nephews, then their children or family should take care of them. That's what it is saying is it is saying that if, if a widow has kids or they have nephews, the family should take care of that widow. And this is something that we don't see nowadays, nowadays because uh, a lot of times um, it's been taught that, you know, for, for women to go get into the workforce and everything else. I will tell you a honoring and glorifying uh, job to have is be a mom and a stay-at-home mom. 
That is an honoring, a God-honoring job. I'm not saying that if you went out and, and you got a job, all of a sudden you're going to go to hell or something like that, you know, but I am going to say a, glor- a God-honoring and glorifying uh, thing to God is a woman who will stay at home and raise the kids and be a keeper of the home. The Bible talks about that all throughout. It talks about those things. And we'll see that here in a little bit. And what does it say? It says, show piety. This is the only time that the word piety uh, is used in the entire Bible. And that just means to show honor and respect towards the Lord. But in this context, what it's saying is to show, uh, you know, uh, piety, or, or sorry, show respect and honor towards the parents or those in authority at home. That piety is saying, it says, show honor and respect to the parents or the authority at home. Why did I say or the, or the authority at home? Well, obviously, in here, it's talking about parents, but we know that there are children nowadays that live at home, and their home is, you know, that there's no parents at home. And so there's an authority figure there. I know of one uh, child that used to come here to, uh, to church all the time. The authority was not his mom because his mom was not there. I mean, she came home, but she wasn't really there. She was on drugs and everything else. So his brother ended up taking care of him. Brother became brother and dad, you know, to his own, uh, to his own brother. And so I would say, you know, uh, for those that, I mean, should he, should he have had to? No, he shouldn't have. He shouldn't have had to do that. Mom was home. She could have, you know, she could have done it, but she decided that she wanted to go out and she wanted to go get high as opposed to taking care of her own children. And so, and it says to requite uh, their parents. This means to repay or pay back the parents to show them honor and respect. When the parents have, you know, passed on, because it's talking about widows here, right? When the parents have, you know, passed on, or it says, or nephews, so it could be an, you know, an aunt. So when the parents have passed away, this, you know, what it's saying is that this is a way of, re, you know, showing them respect and repaying them because of why? Because they brought them up right, and now you're bringing them up right. And these, uh, the kids, that when they respect and honor, that is bringing back honor upon their parents and upon you if you're taking care of those kids. And so um, it says, for this is good and acceptable before God. We want to do those things that are good and acceptable before God, right? There are things, like I said, nowadays that in our culture that, you know, are allowed, you know, they talk about all the time, they're saying that this is what you should do, this is whatever, I mean, one of the biggest things that, uh, you, you, you know, you hear, especially in regards to what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, is they talk about how uh, men and women in the workforce make so much more, you know, different of money and everything else, well, you know, and all this, and they, they said that women should be in the workforce. Well, if you, we, you look at what the Bible says, they, they should be at home. I am not saying, okay, listen to me when I say this, I am not saying that if you're you know, say like you're late teens and you're going on to college and everything else and you go and get an education, somehow you're going to hell, okay? Or the fact that before you get married, you go and you uh, have this job for a while that you're going to, or before you have children that, oh, no. I'm saying, you know, I'm saying obviously at that time, there's no one there to take care of you. The Bible talks about the man being the head of the household and, and, and working while the wife is the keeper of the house. It actually even says the guide of the house, and then, obviously, later on, if a person is a widow, which we're talking about here in this context, is the fact that if they don't have any children that are around or near or whatever that don't, you know, take care, then maybe the mom, ha- you know, maybe that the widow has to go out and work, which, you know, hopefully that's not the case. Um, and as obviously, we're going to see here in the case of where the church would actually you know, would, uh, should step in and be able to take care of that widow as well. In verse 5, it says, now that uh, she is... Now that she is a widow indeed and desolate, uh, trusteth in God, and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. The word desolate just simply, simply, simply means alone or solitary, that she's all alone. All right, there's nothing, you know, there, she's not, uh, you know, there's nobody else around her. It's one who trusts in the Lord is willing to, uh, to pray no matter what time of day or night. Because of the fact uh, this person being a widow and nobody else home, you know, the, the, uh, that whenever they get a prayer request or something like that, or they you know, think the Bible says that they should be willing to pray no matter what time or day. And I'm not saying that if it's like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and you're awoke and, and you're like, hey, I need to pray for so-and-so. I'm not saying that you got to get you know, down for five hours and, and pray for that person. Sometimes, you know, you could just sit there and, and pray in your bed and say, you know, Lord, I don't know what's going on with them, but Lord, you do and be with them. Amen. You know, uh, something short, you know, and sweet, you know, on that. But just being ready, you know, to pray continu- uh, continuously, you know, pray without ceasing, as the Bible says. We see this with uh, Anna, who was a prophetess in Luke chapter 2. 
Luke chapter 2, verses 36 and 37, that says this. It says, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Azer. She was of great age and had lived with a, with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about a, four sca- a score and four years. So in other words, 84 years. When, uh, when she depart, uh, when departed not uh, from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayer, fastings and prayers, night and day, and so we see that you know what, just because she was you know widow does not mean like all of a sudden you stop being a believer. There's some people that like retire or they become a widow or somebody passes away and they like they're just there, like life all of a sudden just stops for them and they don't move forward. And the Bible says that you know what they have a great responsibility you know for the widow is to be uh, willing to pray night and day uh, for anybody at that time. That's a great you know, thing to do. When missionaries come in or, or we ask you to pray, that is a huge thing to do when we ask for, uh, for people to pray. Don't ever think that by you praying that that's something small. Praying is a huge thing. Why? Because you're taking that request before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the only one who can answer that prayer. I mean, nobody else in this world can answer that prayer but Jesus, Right? And by a person doing that and, and willing to do that is a great thing. Verses 6 and 7 talk about the fact that uh, it's, it's probably referring to those who are uh, rich. Let me read uh, verses 6 and 7 first. It says, but, uh, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, and these things uh, give in charge that they may be blameless. So in verse 6, basically, we see here that um, this is probably referring to those, uh, to those who, who are rich after their husband had passed, but uh, got caught in the pleasures of this world and were uh, dead to the cause of Christ. That they indulged so much so on the things of this world that they lost sight of the cause of Christ. That they were so focused on pleasure and everything else, it was all about pleasing them instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to go do what Jesus would have me to do. Whatever God has me to do, whatever, whatever he needs me to do, you know, um, if he needs me to uh, you know, give you know, a part of my uh, inheritance to um, you know, a missionary so they can go preach the gospel, that's what I need to do. If I, you know, if I need to go talk to somebody about Jesus, that's what I need to go to do. You know, just those things to keep these things going um, as well. There's been ladies that I know, you know that, were, um, that I've heard, read about and heard about that when their husband passed and there was nobody else there and like their kids maybe were grown and they were... What did they do? They all of a sudden became either foster parents or they adopted children because they're like, you know what, my life's not over yet. And they wanted to be able to still influence those kids. And so that's what they ended up doing. And some of you say, you know, I'm, I got my grandkids and that's about all I can handle, all right? Um, but the thing is, is that it's all a matter of, of, you know, up to you as far, you know, in regards to that. And Paul, you know, in verse 7, urges Timothy to tell the church so they can, they can be found to be blameless instead of useless in the cause of Christ. He doesn't want us to be useless. He wants, you know, he wants us uh, to be blameless uh, before the Lord um, as well. And in verse 8 it says, If any provide not for his own, ho- uh, for his own especially for, his own, uh, for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is, uh, is worse than an infidel. Now, some of us sit there and say, well, this is pretty self-explanatory, and it is. If a man doesn't provide for his family, then people will see how, that, uh, how he says that he follows Christ, that he goes to church, that he does all these things for it, and they're going to reject Christ. Why? Because they're looking at him and saying, he's supposed to be my example. I mean, there's at least five times I can think of, you know, in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul says something to the effect of imitate me as I follow after Christ or follow me as I follow Christ or do as, you know, do as I do. So in other words, we're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to live that life according to what the Bible says so the way other people don't reject Christianity, but they embrace it by the way that we live. And if a man is sitting, you know, sitting at home saying, I'm going to be a housewife or a house husband, same thing, you know, and say, well, you know, and I know that this goes against like culture nowadays because we have ones nowadays that say, well, the wife's going to go out and she's going to do all this stuff that she's, you know, she's going to make the money and the husband's going to stay at home. It's not supposed to be that way. We, we see how God's word says it in here. Um, and one of the reasons why I believe that, you know, that's the reason is because a, a woman is, is more nurturing than a man and he, you know, that she can be there for her kids in a way that the husband cannot be. The husband, after a while, may want to, you know, strangle the child. 
but the, you know, the mother's just going to say, oh, come over here. You know, she may give her a, little, you know, a couple swats here and there, but she's going to be you know, a little bit more understanding as she goes. But anyways, but like I say, we're supposed to live our life in such a way that people accept the truth, not deny the truth. And the Bible says, you know, if, if they're not providing, if a man is not providing for his own house, that he is worse than an infidel. That is like one that is, you know, you're worse than a heathen. You're worse than those that deny Christ or don't deliver for Christ. That's what it says, that you're worse than a heathen. The Christian man who doesn't pro uh, uh, provide denies what the Bible says that the man is supposed to work and provide for his family, as I just said. And then we're going to see here, these are the requirements. The next part we're going to talk about in verses 9 through 10 is, 9 and 10 is, the requirements for the church to take care of a widow. All right? And this is a pretty, um, very, uh, very uh, specific set of, of rules. So it's a, it's a rare case that the church is supposed to take care of a widow, okay? Number one is this. They are supposed to be three score years old. That's 60 years old. They are supposed to be uh, at least 60 years or older for the church, you know, to even consider it, right? That's what it says in verses 9 and 10. It says, let not the widow uh, be taken in the number uh, under, uh, underscore three score years old, having been the wife of one man. And that's the next one is that she is the wife of one man. So she can't be like, you know, married and divorced, married and divorced, married and divorced, married and divorced. But it says a husband of one man. Or sorry, the wife of one man. Sorry, that was... Okay, so... Um, and it says, well reported, uh, well reported of for good works. That means that, you know, they go out, they talk about the Lord, they, they do these things, that they're, they're always busy, they're not sitting there idle, they're not doing just, you know, they're not, you know, we're going to get to the fact of, of uh, what it says about the younger widows here, that they're, they're busy bodies and they go around doing all kinds of things. It says, that they, uh, it, it says in uh, verse 10, brought up children, that they were to have brought up children. And so that's one of the requirements as well, that they are to have stayed at home, taken care of the children, brought them up, right? Um, and, and that she has supposed to, she, is, uh, she should have lo uh, lodged strangers. So it could be anywhere from missionaries or whatever people that, you know, she doesn't know that she, she lodges them. She take, you know, she, that she takes care of those ones. Um, I know my wife, she loves being hospitable towards the uh, missionaries. They'll come over to our house. And the people say that, you know, it's, like, uh, it's better than staying at a hotel. And that, that's, our, that's the whole point and purpose is that, um, they feel better than going to a hotel. It says, wash the saints' feet. This is not meaning that you have to go over to everybody in the church and start washing their feet. Because that would, you know, some would be uh, kind of disgusted by that after a while. But what it is saying is that you, are, that the ladies have been, or this woman has been serving the church. That she's been doing, you know, taking care of the church, doing different things. It could be like cleaning up the church. It could be doing finances for the church. It could be do all kinds of different things uh, for the church. Relieve the afflicted. This is, they take, they've taken care of the afflicted or the sick, that when somebody is sick, that they're always like looking for a way to be able to help them, to bring them relief in that. Uh, number eight is diligently follow every good work. This is basically that their, their desire, their heart is that they want to follow what the Bible says for them to do, that they have that heart, that they're that Proverbs 31 woman. And you say, well, that's a hard thing to follow. It's the fact that you have that heart to do it. I'm not saying you have to be perfect in these things, but you have to have that heart that you want to do everything in the, in the Word of God. Because no matter what, I mean, that's, that's just kind of you know, what it's going to be as well. One person said this, is that aged, and, uh, aged females who have been distinguished for devotion to Christ and usefulness uh, to men and who have no relatives to support them should be supported by the church of which they are members. And, uh, and as far as maybe rendered comfortable and useful. So in other words, you know, this is saying they got to meet this criteria and they have no family to be able to take care of them for whatever reason. That they have no children that are, you know, around, you know, no, uh, no one around to, uh, to help them, no family. And um, obviously they have been bringing up the children, so they haven't been out, you know, working. So, the, you know, the church should be looking at, you know, actually, honestly, you know, helping them to make ends meet. You know, helping them, you know, in all those areas. But like I said, you read that list of eight different things, and it, it narrows it down really fast, doesn't it? That that's, you know, shows that it's a very special case. Because, you know, the ninth one, obviously, you know, or whatever, because it, it's talking about, earlier it talked about having children or nephews. 
that was taking care of the widow. But if they have no children and nephews, no family around, then that, that part plus the other eight uh, fit into this factor here, uh, fit into this part. Now we look at verses 11 through 15. And this is talking about the fact that younger widows should get married again. That if a, uh, if, if a woman is widowed at a younger age, under 60, that they should get married again. Why? Because the Bible says that, let me see, uh, right, uh, let me look uh, right here. That it will, <clears throat> because, well, and uh, it says, you know, that they have begun to wax wanton against Christ. That, in other words, uh, some, when, uh, after a while, they are unwilling to get married. They just are like, I don't want to get married anymore. I'm not going to do this. But the Bible says that they are to get married, that a younger widow is supposed to get married, that they should. And the thing is, because you know why? The church has no obligation to take care of them. Because the Bible says that they are to do what? That a woman is to, uh, is to be the keeper of the home, the guide of the home, you know, have children, and to be able to do those things. Well, the state doesn't pay you to do that. And so the Bible says it is good for the younger widows to get married again, that, that they should get married again uh, along those things. Because the reason why here is, is that it says they, become to get, they begin to be get um, idle or bored. And we all know that idle minds are the devil's workshop. That's where everything you know, kind of bad happens. We have a lot of people in town that have idle minds, that they're not doing, you know, they're not doing anything, so they have ways to get themselves in trouble. Basically, I mean, and Paul is, yes, talking, you know, to the ladies here, but, you know, Paul in other areas talks about the men working. Obviously, he just talked about the men, you know, uh, you know that, that if they don't work, that they are worse than an infidel, that they should provide for their house, right? And so um, the thing is, is that if, if a man's going out and he's working, you know, hard, you know, uh, throughout the day, he's not going to have time to be idle. He's not going to sit there and have time to sit there and think about ways to get himself in trouble. He's not going to sit there and you know, think about ways he, that he can commit adultery or fornication against his, you know, against his wife. He's not going to have time to. We have way too many people that have way too much time on their hands. They have idle minds and whatever. It's the same thing that Paul is talking about here as far as the ladies. Like I said, Paul's not against women. He's not you know, like this barbarian or whatever, and he's not hating on women, but he, he's, he's saying that women have a role and a job. And like I said, that, dro- that job is honorable and glorious, honestly. That's how the Bible says it. And I know that in a modern day, you know, the modern day uh, society that we are, that is pretty much post-Christian, it says that you know, if a woman stays at home, somehow or another, that she better you know, uh, allow it, or her husband is, you know, is a terrible you know, jerk, and that you know, she should divorce him. But the Bible says that it is honorable, that it is a glorious thing to do that, you know, for a woman to stay at home and raise the children, teach the children, be the keeper of the home, the guide of the home. Okay? And so, you know, take, like I said, uh, if they are being the keeper of home, of the home, this is what Paul is saying, if they're being the keeper of the home, the guide of the home, then they won't have time to be idle either. If, I mean, if you have children... We have one that keeps us on our toes as far as keeping our house, you know, keeping the house clean. Let alone having more than that. But you know that if, you know if if you, you know you're on that, you're you're staying on that, you're you're keeping and you're, you're you're cleaning up and you're doing all those things. You're keeping the home. You're doing all these things that you know the Bible says for you to do. You're not going to have time to be a tattler, as the Bible says, or a busybody. I think of you know the next part. I said you know like talking on the phone. I think of. Um, Lucille Ball on I Love Lucy. I mean, they always showed her her house. Was, I mean, of course, her apartment was like two, uh, two rooms, and that's, or three rooms. There was a kitchen, the main room, and then like the bedroom, and that was it. That, her, you know, that it was always you know, clean, but then somewhere or another, she always had time to talk to, uh, you know, talk to Ethel and get in, in trouble. And we always see how that always worked. And everybody's like going, well, that's a funny show. That's hilarious. Well, it's obviously going against what you know, is uh, teaching here that they should not be busybodies or going around because if Lucy was doing the things that I guess that she needed to do, she wouldn't have had time to get in trouble with Ethel all the time. Of course, then there would have been no TV show. And it is a TV show. And you go, Sean, that's a, you know, uh, you know, Pastor Sean, that's a TV show. What does that matter? I said, yeah, I know, because there's no way, especially she, after she had little Ricky, that she could have kept that house clean and still got into the trouble that she did with Ethel. There's no way. 
That's obviously the reason why, you know, it's a TV show because there's somebody there to clean up and, you know, on those things as well. But we see these things in here in verse 14. It said earlier, you know, when I said the fact that younger, it says younger widows should get married again, it says this in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So uh, what is the Apostle Paul insinuating here or flat out just saying? He says, you know what? I want the younger women to get married. Why? Because to bear more children. Oftentimes, children are looked at, are looked at as being like this, this pain and this hindrance to life. They are not. The Bible says that they are an inheritance and a reward. Okay? That they are actually a gift from the Lord. And so it says, you know, to guide the house. That is by, you know, uh, you know that is by... Uh, teaching the children, guiding the house, keeping all that, you know, stuff together. And like I said, you know, if there was a wage for a woman, you know, that stays at home and takes care of the kids, and does, it would far, far outweigh that of what a man makes. I'll just tell you that right now. Because there's a lot of stuff that, you know, moms do, uh, stay-at-home moms do. And like I say... If they're doing all this, you know, the ladies are doing all this stuff, they're staying at home, and the husband's doing all that, you know what, at the end of the day, if the husband's out working hard, he's been, you know, uh, uh, just working hard doing his thing, and, and the w- wife is, you know, being the guy of the house, the keeper of the house, when it comes, you know, time to go to sleep, there's not going to be any time, you know, to stay, uh, sit on your phone or, to, you know, try to get your mind to decompress. What you're going to do is that you're going to get in bed, collapse, and fall asleep, and there's no time for you to be idle or, you know, let your mind just wander, Right? And in verse 16, it says this. It says, If any man or woman that believeth uh, have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. It's basically saying that if any person sees that there's a widow, there's widows around, and, and uh, it doesn't follow, uh, fall into the 60-plus uh, area that they were just talking about, that they should take care of them or find family that, you know, that does. Why? Because that way that, uh, that uh, person is not a burden to the church. Because if you, if you begin to have a whole bunch of widows at the church that don't fall into, you know, don't, don't fall into that category that I just read in verses 9 and 10, then that's going to be a huge burden to the church. It's going to be a huge financial burden to the church to be able to take care of them, right? And so that's what it's uh, telling us there. Number three is this. This is the treatment of elders. This, uh, you know, speaks of older men who are pastors or, or those that are, have that, uh, that wisdom. They are they, are they who um, labor in the word and in doctrine. We see this in verse 17. It says, let the elders that rule well be accounted uh, worthy of double, double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. He is speaking of pastors in this, ones that, you know, are laboring in... In uh, you know, in the, in the word and in doctrine, right? And so it could be you know, sorry, a pastors or deacons or uh, you know, in that same area as well. It says they're worthy of double honor, and it said you know, it's it goes on to say that a pastor is worthy of their pay. It says this also uh, reiterates this in Luke chapter ten verse seventeen uh, seven. It says, and in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worth, is worthy of his hire. And so that's what he, he is saying that, you know what, don't ever sit there and think that just because you're young or you, whatever, because I've had people, and I've said this before, we had people come up to me and say, it must be nice just to work on Sundays and Wednesdays. And I said, yeah, that must be, as, you know, whenever you can find that, you know, please let me know because I'd like to know what that job is. Because that doesn't exist, especially for pastors. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist that way for deacons because deacons also get phone calls too. They also, you know, have times where they're, you know, they're not only have their, you know, the jobs that they have outside of the church, but then, you know, that there's somebody in the church that needs help, they're there as well. Verses nine, uh, 19 and 20 goes on and it talks about church discipline. Let's look at these. It says, against an, uh, against an elder... Receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, 
that others also may fear. So he is, he is uh, you know, going back to an Old Testament principle. He is talking about the fact that, you know what, just because one person says it doesn't mean that it's true. He's saying, you know, the, in the fact that you've got to have two to three witnesses in order for it to be established. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. It says, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity uh, or for any sin, in any, uh, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, three witnesses shall the matter be established paul goes on you know in in second corinthians he's 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 vocalizing this as well in second corinthians 13 1 it says this it says this is the third time i am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established this is where we get the law that like if a crime happens that they have to have two or three witnesses in order for it to actually make it you know in a court of law because if there's only one person, if there's just two people arguing about one another, you're just going to go, okay, they're just arguing and bickering. We can't figure everything out. But if you, if you have, you know, um, if you have like somebody else, I mean, or sorry, if you have this, one, you have two people arguing and then that one witness, you're going to say, well, that one, uh, that one person is just like the best friend of that one, and they're automatically going to take their side. But if you have two or three witnesses, you can, you know, kind of figure it out and get the whole situation resolved. And that's what it's, it's going on in here to say is, is that if an elder's sin and is found guilty, then they are to be reprimanded or strongly warned before the church so that others may fear and stay away from that sin. This is something that you don't see nowadays in church. You don't see a church discipline. A lot of churches, it's like a free-for-all in what happens. There's, there's no order. There's no discipline. There's none of that in the church. And the thing is, is that it's kind of like you're run by all the nuts. And just be, you know, and that's and that's definitely not the fruit of the spirit. I'll tell you that. And so, we need to realize that just because a person is an elder, if they are, you know, if they do sin, the Bible says that we are to, you know, obviously two or three witnesses. And then, if they don't want to, you know, follow those two or three witnesses, he says to do what? Bring it before the church. Reprimand them, you know, and strongly warn them before the church. Not only so, hopefully, that they will repent of that sin that they've been doing, but also that others would fear, man, I hope I never do that. Or if they are doing it, they're like, okay, I want to get this taken care of right now before it, if it gets to that point. We get so many times, you know, if that were to happen, we have you know, people nowadays that will sit there and say, you know, oh, I'm going to leave the church because I cannot believe the pastor did that. That's what the Bible says to do. And the reason why it wants you to do that is it's hoping that the person that is called out, the person that is reprimanded, repents and sees the error of their ways. So that way they can come back into the, you know, the church family. But people don't like that. They don't like to be called out nowadays because you know, it hurts their feelings. Verse 21, it says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou shalt observe, or thou observe, uh, these things without preferring one before, uh, before another, doing nothing by partiality. In short, do not show any favoritism. Don't show any favoritism. Don't, you know, don't sit there and say, well, this, this person I know gives more money, or I like this person more than the other person, or however it is. The Bible says don't show any favoritism. Don't show any par partiality. And that's how it's supposed to be. Now, obviously, you're going to have people in the church that, you know, somebody may get along with, you know, or like, you know, they have the same interests. That's not the fact of showing favoritism, because the thing is, is that hopefully, even in that, you know, relationship that the person has, that they, are, they still will call out that person when they're doing wrong. That's how it should be, and the person shouldn't get offended by that either. Be like, well, I thought you were my friend. Yes, I am your friend, and I love you enough to tell you when you're doing wrong, Right? It's just like the you know, thing with a parent. A parent's going to tell a child when they're doing wrong. They love that child, and that's the reason why they tell them when they're doing something wrong. It's because they don't want them to get hurt. They don't want them to, to mess up you know, the witness. They want, they want them to get right before the Lord. Verse 22, it says, a lay, uh, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of, any, you know, of, of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. In other words, do not hastily appoint somebody to ministry. 
That's the reason why, like, you know, like for one thing, our bylaws say that if a person is going to be a deacon, they got to at least be, uh, they have to at least be going to this church for a year before they're even considered to be qualified. You don't want to hastily put somebody uh, in an area of ministry. You know why? Because if, if they are very immature, you're going to have somebody on a power trip. And thinking that they can, you know, they can do no wrong. They're going to start you know, uh, causing all kinds of problems you know, around the church. Or it's going to go the opposite way. They're going to get run over by everybody. And they're going to come over and say, like, I'm going to go talk to so-and-so because I know I can get what I want when I talk to them. Because you know what? All I got to do is just bully them a little bit and I'll be able to get what I want. You say, Pastor, does that happen in church? Yes. Sad thing is, is you know, it, it happens more times than you, you know, more times than I like to think, you know, that it does. Is that you have people either on one side of it, you know, the person gets in there, and uh, you know, uh, they're just ripping everybody, and then you, or on the other side, you get the person that's way too passive, and they're just letting everybody do whatever they want. And so it's it's one of those things that you know doesn't.